it really is an honor, uh, Sarah, to have you here um, with your uh, wealth of experience uh, in government, both uh, in the legislative and executive branches, and at one of our esteemed sister institutions uh, at uh, Harvard University uh, and throughout your long and distinguished career in working on these uh, issues um, which come together in such a powerful way in the subject that you're going to address today. It's an honor for us to uh, have you here. And I can't think of uh, any subject that is more uh, timely and compelling for um, uh, our national interest and for global uh, security than countering violent extremism. So uh, now I have the pleasure of welcoming um, one of the kind of rising figures in Stanford in government, our own freshman uh, from Turkey, Belce Dogru, and she will introduce the undersecretary. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Professor Diamond. Um, um, welcome, everyone. My name is Belce Doğru, and I'm the Stanford in Government member here to introduce um, Dr. Sarah Sewell. Um, Dr. Sarah Sewell is a longtime ag advocate for advancing civilian security and human rights around the world. Um, she was sworn in as Undersecretary for Civilian Security, Democracy, and Human Rights in 2014. She serves concurrently as the Special Coordinator for Tibetan Issues. And over the past decade, at the Harvard Kennedy School, Dr. Sewell served as director of the Carr uh, Center for Human Rights Policy and also directed the uh, Program on National Security and Human Rights. Dr. Sewell has extensive experience partnering with the U.S. Armed Forces around civilian security. At the Kennedy School, she launched the Mass Atrocities Response Operation Project to assist the U.S. military in contingency planning to protect civilians from large-scale violence. She was a member of the Defense Policy Board and also served for six years as the Senior Foreign Policy Advisor to U.S. Senate Majority Leader George J. Mitchell. She earned a PhD at Oxford University where she was a Rhodes Scholar. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sir Sewell. So thank you so much, Belche and Larry, and um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Oh, my goodness, the weather. <laughs> I'm sure you hear that from everyone who, who ventures from the East Coast, particularly in these winter months. But um, it does make me rethink the wisdom of my undergraduate educational choices. Um, <laughs> But in terms of, of where I had spent much of the, the last decade plus prior to rejoining the government, um, the Kennedy School is, ha, has a lot to offer. It, it, it has President Kennedy's legacy. Um, he, he inspired legions of public servants with his vision of courage and call for a man on the moon and wringing peace from the Cuban Missile Crisis, his judgment to drop out of Stanford's MBA program. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, but really, it is such a beautiful campus. And I did not fully appreciate, because I have never been here before, um, what it feels like to be in a first class institution with first class teachers and incredible students and this climate. So you all have it really, really, really good. Um, and. I'm really pleased to be here today to talk to you because it's too easy to spend my time talking both inside the Beltway and even on the Northeast Corridor. It's really important to be out speaking to um, more of the country. And um, I am planning to stop in the middle of the country on the way back. So it won't be, just be bi-coastal. But the topic that I'm going to talk about today is an issue that I've been working, that I frankly worked on before I joined the administration when I, when I worked on Senator Obama's campaign for president um, in the very early phases and worked on his very first speech on terrorism, which as you may recall was widely criticized for saying that he would, um, he would attack uh, known terrorists wherever they were. And at the time, um, people criticized that statement and not only did he mean it, he did it. Um, but he always had a more robust and comprehensive view of what it would take to eliminate violent extremism. And so it's been a real honor and privilege 
to for just over two years now be serving in his administration to get to help uh, more fully flesh out the vision that I believe he has had for a very long time. Um, violent extremism is not a new threat. I mean, that's one of the most important things to state right up front. Um, violent extremists of various forms have raged against civilization as long as people have sought to build and strengthen civilization. And what's new today, and I'm sorry, I'm double mic'd. Are you hearing me all right? Um, what's new today is how the U.S. and our partners are pushing back against violent extremism with a more comprehensive, preventive, and civilian-centered approach that we call countering violent extremism or in uh, the Beltway way of acronyms CVE. How do we come to this approach? I just told you a little bit about where President Obama has been. More broadly, we as a country have come to that approach by learning. And I want to just tell you the story, sort of the simplistic bumper sticker of the learning that's transpired. I remind you that it's been over a decade since the searing experience of 9-11 and following those attacks, the United States does what it does very well. Once the beast is awakened, it, it roars loud, watch out, right? So we built a range of counterterrorism tools to keep the nation safe, uh, from airport security to intelligence collection, military operations, security assistance, spent hundreds of billions of dollars, hired new people, built new institutions, and we deployed military force around the world to great effect. Yet even as the United States targeted al-Qaeda's leadership, its remnants dispersed and adapted. They and other terrorist groups continued on, exploiting local grievances about insecurity, unemployment, sectarianism, or marginalization to merge their terror apparatus with militias, with criminal networks, with insurgencies. And in doing so, they created affiliates and inspired savage new groups like Boko Haram and the so-called Islamic State, or Daesh. Now, the rise of these groups revealed that while traditional hard approaches to counterterrorism remain critical for protecting Americans and others from immediate terror threats, these tools are ill-equipped for preventing the new generation of violent extremist threats from emerging. That requires a broader approach, one that not only takes the fight to existing violent extremist networks around the world, but that prevents people from taking up ex violent extremism in the first place. And that's the fundamental rationale behind what we call CVE. CVE begins with understanding or seeking to understand what motivates individuals, but also communities, and there are important distinctions between the two to align with violent extremist groups. As you can imagine, there is no simple answer. The motives are complex, overlapping, and highly context-specific. Sometimes, to help untangle them, I find it useful to refer to psychologist Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs, where at the bottom, as many of you will know, are the physical needs like food, security, and shelter. And then further up that pyramid, there come more abstract needs, like the needs for community and identity and purpose. And when any of these needs go unmet, they can act uh, as push factors that make people or communities more vulnerable to the pull, the lure, of various violent ideologies. Now, every case of radicalization to violence results from a complex and context-specific interaction between push and pull factors. This helps to explain how violent extremists have been able to draw recruits from such diverse backgrounds of individuals, as we all know. This complexity necessitates a longer-term approach that is once broader and more creative, but it's also more targeted and contextual. And CVE attempts to strike that balance in three important ways. As we look at the world as the United States of America, we look to expand the who, what, and the where of our approach to counterterrorism. To begin with the what, CVE broadens the focus to address the push and pull dynamics that fuel extremism, not just attack the symptoms. Uh, in doing so, it seeks to reverse both the growth of the active groups, but also to prevent that next generation from emerging. What does this mean? 
Dealing with push factors essentially means addressing the underlying grievances that the violent extremists exploit. President Obama likes to say that when people, especially young people, feel entirely trapped in impoverished communities where there is no order, where there is no path for advancement, and when there are no educational opportunities, where there are no ways to support families and no escape from injustice and the humiliation of corruption, that feeds instability and disorder, and it makes those communities ripe for extremist recruitment. Now, addressing the pull factors means challenging the twisted narratives and the recruitment tactics that violent extremists wield to influence communities and target vulnerable individuals. I understand that Undersecretary Stengel was here on this campus not long ago. He focuses predominantly on those, those pull factors. The CVE approach is much broader than counter-messaging. It is addressing push factors as well. And when you think about the tools that we typically associate with counterterrorism, hard counterterrorism, the drones, the soldiers, the spies, it's clear that as important as they are for keeping us safe, they don't address either the pull or the push factors. You can't wiretap a grievance and you can't bomb away a hateful ideology. And so that brings me to the who. CVE calls for an integrated and holistic approach to address push and pull factors that fuel violent extremists. Governments, of course, have a critical role in this work because governments have to ensure security, again, at the base of that pyramid. They have to ensure respect for human rights and the rule of law, and they cannot effectively, but they cannot effectively address the complex set of factors that can create fertile ground um, that requires a broader range of actors. And so these will include civil society, businesses, religious leaders, women, youth, international bodies, and former violent extremists. And this is what we mean when we say that a whole of society approach is required to prevent that next generation from being radicalized. And an integrated CVE approach depends on coordination among these various stakeholders which means building trust and repairing fraught relationships between the government and actors in civil society or marginalized communities, as well as safeguarding space for the civil society actors themselves to operate and to peacefully express their views. And this can get complicated, and I'll come back to this uh, a little later on. But finally, in terms of the overview, the third major difference is the where. CVE calls for broadening our focus to the upstream risks by supporting communities that are being targeted by, by terrorist groups. These are not necessarily the epicenters of current conflicts. These are not the places that terror networks already control. They're the places that are on the periphery of those areas where individuals are nonetheless vulnerable to large-scale radicalization and recruitment. We've seen how Daesh, from its base of operations in Iraq and Syria, has targeted communities in countries like Egypt, Jordan, and Lebanon. By broadening our focus to these at-risk but largely peaceful still communities, CVE seeks to prevent the expansion of terror networks by proactively addressing the grievances that they try to exploit and to keep vulnerable communities strong and stable. Now obviously neither the United States or a broader coalition of actors can fully address all the potential grievances that could create fertile ground for people to be unhappy and from which that terrorists could seek to exploit. Neither can we address all of the structural inequities that exist or repair all relationships between fraught elements of government and citizenry. So because the need is ultimately greater than our ability to focus resources and solve problems, focusing really is the key. It is, it is getting that who, what, and where right, determining which communities are the most vulnerable, which underlying forces are the most prominent in fueling violent extremism, and which interventions or local actors are best positioned to help. Now we have a lot to learn on this scale. We're relatively new in this work, but we are making progress. In the past year, the Department of State has established an in-house unit to analyze the underlying drivers of violent extremism in different global contexts. We're also experimenting with a new approach to programming used, programming using pooled funds to incentivize collaboration in problem diagnosis and in developing integrated program design. Using this approach, the State Department and USAID 
analyze communities across East Africa to better understand al-Shabaab's efforts to recruit and expand in areas beyond its control. Now, our interagency team in the, is in the field identifying the most at-risk communities to distill the key factors that contribute both to their vulnerability and their resilience to violent extremism. And the team will be designing programs tailored to address these factors and then we'll be providing funding in a novel way, which is to those who are best positioned to carry out the funding as opposed to starting from who has the funding, what do you already do, and how do we throw it at the problem? So it's a, it's a reverse engineering of the typical bureaucratic process to get the right people working on the right pieces in the right communities. This is a pilot approach for what we hope will be a growing element of U.S. foreign assistance through a new global counterterrorism partnership fund. Governments, communities, and international organizations are also looking to independent actors like the Institute and the broader Stanford community for contributions to research and analysis in this burgeoning field of countering violent extremism. Just last September, I attended the launch of Resolve, R-E-S-O-L-V-E. -E. I can't tell you what it stands for because it's not written down here, but it's something about research. It's a new network for researchers, especially pairing those who are situated in, in established universities with local researchers who are often operating uh, quite independently and on their own and without a lot of support. And, and there are really interesting partnerships being developed in that regard. So this is a, a, a network that helps researchers both link uh, internationally, nationally, and locally um, and helps them share their findings uh, and their resources as they work to uncover both what can drive and what can prevent violent extremism. It's a new platform to engage and assist non-governmental actors, and I certainly hope that the Institute will support its development by contributing scholarship or mentoring local researchers. Now, the Resolve Network is one part of a broader global movement behind CVE, and this movement really was invigorated beginning last February at the White House Summit on Countering Violent Extremism. That summit, which the President hosted, um, really launched this comprehensive CVE approach that now encompasses over 100 countries, 20 multilateral bodies, and some 400 civil society organizations across the globe. As a result of our efforts, foreign governments are developing national CVE strategies that provide meaningful roles for those outside of government. One of the most interesting things about both the White House summit and the multiple regional summits that followed was that in some cases, for the first time ever, civil society organizations ranging from you know, parents groups to youth uh, advocacy organizations were sitting with their governments. Some, some conversations were happening that never would have happened back at the ranch. And it was a very interesting moment to look around the room and see the most senior representatives of governments being seated uh, equally with civil society representatives as well as people from the private sector and religious leaders and all the rest. So really a different mix, a different set of actors to be part of a, of a different approach to solving a very, a very broad problem. So these national CVE strategies are also meant to be vehicles that can encourage and sustain engagement of uh, gov the government apparatus with civil society in those nations. And many of the actors, young people, mayors, and women, have launched their own global networks to learn from each other's experience countering violent extremism in their communities. Larry and I were talking earlier about how interesting it is for those of us who sort of study international, international relations structures, the emergence of these almost wiki platforms that uh, exist to bring um, some semblance of the architecture that states have long availed themselves of, whether it's through the UN or through a, a, a treaty or through a regional organization and a series of meetings and conferences, that kind of a platform has not existed in the same way for many of these other actors that are really critical. So for example, I'm not sure if I have it later in my speech, so I may repeat myself, but the Strong Cities Network, for example, is a really interesting um, uh, network that has sprung up as part of this uh, CVE summit process where sub-national government leaders, so mayors and municipal leaders, as well as community leaders from those same municipalities can come together to talk about how they're dealing with countering violent extremism in their own local communities. Again, trying to push the solutions and the analysis and the action down to the local level. So we've had to, to try to help uh, foster the architectures that can sustain that kind of work globally. And very importantly, just last month, uh, UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon released his UN 
plan of action for preventing violent extremism. And in doing this, he is providing the framework for how all member states and bodies within the UN, like UNESCO and the UN Development Program, can contribute to this common effort. And I think that's a really welcome and important development, uh, although it's still in its early stages. Now, as the Under Secretary of State um, responsible for fighting both terrorism, for both for fighting terrorism and for promoting human rights, um, I have been intimately involved in this effort to encourage a proactive and affirmative approach to reducing the threat of violent extremism. And I have been privileged to see firsthand how countries around the world have benefited or could benefit from embracing a broader approach to violent extremism in the spirit of CVE. In countries that I've traveled to as diverse as Nigeria, Egypt, Burma, and Kenya, I've seen similar forces combine to create that fertile soil for violent extremism to take root. And I've seen how when police, police abuse communities or when security forces harass or detain entire neighborhoods on mere suspicion, they leave a trail of grievances and mistrust that violent extremism, extremists eagerly exploit. When prisons mix petty criminals with hardcore terrorists, governments literally create captive audiences for hateful ideologies, needlessly expanding the threat that they face domestically. And additionally, instances of government abuse and torture push prisoners further down that path of radicalization. When corruption goes unaddressed, citizens can conclude that government exists not to serve, but to exploit. Secretary Kerry recently called corruption a radicalizer. He said this at Davos, because it destroys faith in legitimate authority. And in such a vacuum, violent extremists that portray themselves as the pious and untainted can offer a seemingly seductive alternative. When there are no jobs and no prospects for a better future, when people struggle to feed and house their families, feelings of hopelessness and indignity can be openings for violent extremists peddling false promises of a better future. And of course, finally, when governments respond to terrorist propaganda by strangling freedoms of speech and assembly, they risk silencing the voices that are most needed to fight violence and hatred because clamping down on political opposition under the guise of fighting terrorism has become all too common around the world. And yet it can backfire spectacularly by radicalizing the nonviolent individual and confirming violence as the only route to political change. Time and again, nations around the world, including the United States, relearn the harsh lessons of framing security as a zero-sum trade-off with fundamental human freedoms. A comprehensive CVE approach recognizes this as a false dichotomy and it highlights the importance of good governance and human rights protections in preventing the next generation of violent extremists. But even in places with a strong history of democracy and human rights like Western Europe, the United States, India, violent extremism remains a real issue. Take the example of India, which has proven quite resistant to recruitment attempts by terrorist groups like Daesh, in large part thanks to its tradition of religious tolerance, which has been a powerful antidote to Daesh's poisonous perversion of Islam. Recent events, however, like the religious conversions coerced by Hindu extremists, or open speculation by some public officials about the loyalty of Indian Muslims, fuel intolerance and open the gateways to violence. In their wake, speaking out for religious freedom is critical, not just as a universal value, but also as an antidote to extremism. And that's true here in the United States where we struggle with our own issues of intolerance. What matters is how citizens and leaders respond. When a teacher mistook a Muslim student's science project for a bomb and sent him to the police, President Obama welcomed him to the White House. And in a time of heightened anxiety following the attacks in San Bernardino, he reminded the country that Muslim Americans are our neighbors, our coworkers, and soldiers on our front lines. But when citizens do fall prey, to violent ideologies. Governments increasingly face tough questions about how to respond. Countries like Denmark have found creative ways to answer that question by pioneering efforts to de-radicalize and rehabilitate violent extremists. In Denmark, if violent extremists renounce their ideology, they're given a chance to receive mental, mental health counseling and learn vocational skills. These programs reduce the risk that they will return to violence. And equally important, the rehabilitated extremist can become a powerful voice against radicalization to violence. 
By contrast, when there is no possible path to reintegrate back in society, the violent extremist may perceive no choice but to keep fighting. And for all of these reasons, de-radicalization and rehabilitation efforts are proliferating around the world. The multiple dimensions of countering violent extremism, protecting rights, providing economic opportunity, mentoring youth, holding security forces accountable, supporting families. This is not that work of soldiers and spies, but of mayors and moms, of communities and faith leaders. CVE means taking a broader and more citizen-centered approach to the threat of violent extremism. It means meeting fundamental human needs for security, opportunity, dignity, and identity to crowd out the grievances upon which violent extremists prey. But let's be clear. CVE is a long-term effort. Jobs and bright futures will not appear overnight. Trust between communities and security forces can take years to build, and local leaders and citizens must find their own roots to reach youth and vulnerable individuals and confront violent extremist propaganda. So this work will continue across generations. At the same time, we can look to a future more confident than we, that we have the right approach. Instead of being reactive and destructive, CVE is fundamentally positive and proactive. It empowers new states, new state actors, new actors entirely. It emphasizes preventive action and it advances our collective security while championing universal values. And most importantly, it shows us how to make sustained progress against this threat and increase the odds that you all will see the shadow of violent extremism recede in your lifetimes. Thanks, and I look forward to the discussion. <laughs>